Last October, in the opening for this show, I quoted tonight's guest by saying, according to Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, if the truth be known, coronary artery disease is a toothless paper tiger that need never, ever exist, and if it does exist, need never, ever progress. Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Spellows from Plant Powered Metro New York, and along with my co-hosts Judith Zerden and Ben Martins, Ben Martin, sorry, Ben, we welcome you to this episode of Heart to Healthy Heart plant-based conversations that can save your life. Judith is unable to be here tonight, so Ben and I will have the honor of hosting tonight's show with the person whose quote that was and who has helped transform people's lives and their cardiovascular issues, including mine and Ben's, by demonstrating that a whole food, plant-based, no oil diet and lifestyle is optimal. As always, we encourage you all to use the chat box to tell us where you're from, as well as ask any questions that you want of our special guest. And we'll try to accommodate as many of your questions as the 30 minute time slot can accommodate. And let's just bring everybody on the screen. And while for most of you, our guest needs no introduction, please allow me to share the bio just so everyone who doesn't know him gets to know him a little better. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn received his BA from Yale University and his MD from Western Reserve University. In 1956, he was awarded a gold medal at the Olympic Games as a member of the victorious U.S. Olympic rowing team. He was trained as a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic and at St. George's Hospital in London. In 68, as an Army surgeon in Vietnam, he was awarded the Bronze Star. He has been associated with the Cleveland Clinic since 1968. In 91, he served as president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons and also organized the first national conference on the elimination of coronary artery disease. In 2005, he became the first recipient of the Benjamin Spock Award for Compassion in Medicine. In 95, he published his benchmark long-term nutritional research, arresting and reversing coronary artery disease in severely ill patients. Dr. Esselstyn, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ben. Well, let's just get right off with the first question of the evening, and that is, Dr. Esselstyn, why is cardiovascular disease so prevalent in this country, whereas in other parts of the world, it's almost non-existent? Yeah, but if you were a heart surgeon and you were going to hang out your shingle in Okinawa, rural China, Central Africa, the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico, the Papua Highlanders in New Guinea, <laughs> forget it you better plan on selling pencils. You're not going to have any heart disease. Why? They thrive on whole food, plant-based nutrition. Mm -hmm. Now, all experts really in this disease would agree that where this disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning, and is when we progressively injure that delicate innermost lining of the artery called the endothelium. And the endothelium manufactures a truly magic molecule of gas called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is responsible for, for the salvation, preservation, and protection of all of our blood vessels because of its remarkable functions. For example, nitric oxide will keep all the cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. It keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thick and stiff or inflamed and protect us from getting high blood, uh, excuse me, protect us from getting blockages or plaque. Now, <clears throat> therefore, whether anybody in the United States or throughout the rest of the world has cardiovascular disease, it is because by now, in the previous decades, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised and turned their endothelial system into a train wreck that they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages and plaque. However, the good news is this. This is not a malignancy. It is a benign foodborne illness. And once you can get patients to understand that never, 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 ever again are they to pass through their lips a single morsel that is going to further injure an already train wrecked endothelium because then the endothelium will recover, make enough nitric oxide so you can not only halt disease progression, we often will see elements of disease reversal. Now, what are the foods that every time they pass our lips, we injure the endothelial cells? They are, number one, any drop of oil. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, 
oil in a chip, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing, oil injures endothelial cells. I wrote a paper that was published in the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention in 2019. And the title of my editorial was, Is Oil Healthy? And then I review all the animal studies and the human studies showing how the uh, <clears throat> oil injures the endothelium. So in addition to getting rid of the oil, we wanna be sure to get rid of animal protein, meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and eggs. Get rid of dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. We wanna also <clears throat> get rid of sugary drinks, diet colas, Pepsi, and Coke. Get rid of sugary foods, cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, molasses, and honey. I do not like peanut butter, nut butters, cashew sauce, avocado, and finally, coffee with caffeine. Decaf, okay, but coffee with caffeine injures endothelial cells. Now, if you've read my book or if you've gone uh, to the computer and tried to look up studies that I've written, you will see that especially, let's say, the Journal of Family Practice in 2014, when I reported some uh, close to 200 patients that we followed close to four, year, four years, and everybody who was compliant with the program stopped any for progression of their disease, no new heart attacks, no strokes, and no deaths. So it was pretty exciting to see how effective this uh, could be. Now, what are you going to eat? You're going to eat all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels, 101 different types of legumes, lentils, and beans, all these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, and some fruit. Now, I made a change in our program about a decade ago out of recognition of the fact that the endothelial production of nitric oxide is age-dependent. You never heard of a boy or a girl at age eight having a heart attack, right? No, they've got nitric oxide coming out of their ears. But by the time they're beautifully healthy at age 50, they have now lost 50% of the nitric oxide they had when they were age 25. And by the time you're 80, you've lost 70%. So the change that I made was I <clears throat> included a greater stimulation of the endothelial production of nitric oxide. And also we embraced the newer research that shows us that mankind has an alternate pathway for making additional nitric oxide. So hold on, here we go. <laughs> I need you to chew, not smoothies, not juicing. I need you to chew uh, six times a day, a green leafy vegetable that is roughly the size of say a quarter or half of your fist after it has first been steamed five and a half to six minutes so it's nice and tender. And then you must you must anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic or rice vinegar. Why? Because research has shown us that these vinegars will restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme, which is contained within the endothelial cell and responsible for making nitric oxide. So you're gonna chew this alongside your breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again with your lunch and sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, <clears throat> dinner time, five, and of course I adore it when you have that evening snack of arugula or kale. Yeah, the let second- Do you wanna let him ask another question? Do you want, yeah. do you want to interrupt for a question? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm no, sorry. we're good. He apps, please continue, Dr. Russelson, we are good. <clears throat> All right, the second benefit that comes from chewing the green leafy vegetable, it restores the capacity of your bone marrow to, to make again the endothelial progenitor cell. What do they do? The endothelial progenitor cell replaces our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. Now the third benefit <clears throat> from chewing the green leafy vegetable, and this is most important. When you are chewing a green leafy vegetable, you are chewing a green nitrate. As you chew the green nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria are going to reduce the nitrate that you're chewing to a nitrite. Now, once you swallow the nitrite, it is your own gastric acid, 
which is going to further reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide, which can enter your nitric oxide pool. So think about it. What you're doing with minimal expense, all right, with minimal expense and, you, and also no hideous side effects, what you are doing all day long, you are restoring nitric oxide, the very molecule, the deficiency of which gave you this disease in the first place. Now, there's a caveat to this. Toothpaste with fluoride, public drinking water with fluoride, or mouthwash will injure the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. And I do not like antacids because antacids will reduce your gastric acidity and you will be unable to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. Now, the top six vegetables would be kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. Now, if you want all of them, they are bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard greens, beet greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, napa, cabbage, brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And the reason I go through that with you is you have to know that whole food plant-based nutrition is also wonderful for your memory. <laughs> Very good. <clears throat> Dr. Asselstein, why no oil? Why not a drop, as you say? How exactly does it injure the endothelial cell cells? Right. The mechanism of that will be worked out, but obviously what it does is it creates inflammation at the border of the endothelial cells. When you get inflammation, then you get cracks, fissures, and openings, and now cholesterol can enter into the subendothelial space and begin for the production of, uh, of plaque and blockage. Let's say if one time I take some oil because I went to a restaurant and they put oil in it, how long does it take until the the endothelial, the, the, sorry, the, uh, the nitro, <laughs> nitric oxide production is again stable? I can't tell you whether it's minutes or hours, but I, but I will tell you this. <clears throat> When you go to a restaurant, And that, that's, they're all potentially your killers. So uh, that's because everything on the menu, when you go to a restaurant, you, you turn your chair and you look directly into the eye of the waiter or the waitress. And you look them at the eye in the eye and say, understand this. I am deathly allergic to a single drop of oil. So mm -hmm. then I say, my goodness, they'll sit down next to you. You'll go over the entire menu. Everything has oil. Now you flatter them. You say, I'd like to talk to the chef. Chef comes out and you say, well, I got this problem. I can't have a drop of oil. I can't have any sugar. I can't have any dairy and I can't have any animal protein. He or she smiles, comes back in 21 minutes with a lovely plate of beans and rice, or it might be a baked potato with a vegetable. But going to a restaurant is never, ever a reason to destroy more endothelial cells. You had mentioned earlier that we lose nitric oxide as we age. What, what, what's the mechanism behind that? What's causing that to occur other than, other than diet, which obviously is, is, is a problem? Well, look at your hair. It's, it's gray. <laughs> I know. It's very gray, <laughs> isn't it? You got wrinkles. That's age. Mm -hmm. You got less nitric oxide. That's age. Question just came in from one of our viewers. But I want you to know that when you do all the things you can that we've talked about, uh, you can really maintain a high enough level of nitric oxide to protect you. Mm -hmm. so you still get the protection from all the good the, the greens that you're eating, even though you, you're making less of it. Uh, yeah, and you're not destroying your endothelial cells. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the audience just heard the oil comment and said, what about a natural, what they call a natural oil form, but I believe what they're talking about is how about nuts? Is that acceptable? Is that not acceptable? Well, I have a number of colleagues and you're right. I'm a bit of an outlier when it comes to nuts. And I'll tell you why. Nuts can be highly addictive. Nuts have a lot of saturated fat, which injures your arteries, Okay. I have yet to see a single study of a group of patients like ours who are seriously ill with heart disease, where a diet heavy in nuts has ever caused an arrest of disease progression or disease reversal. Now, there was also an interesting study 
1975 or six, I believe, by Veselinovich and his team. And uh, they did an st interesting study on rhesus monkeys. Three groups. One group was getting butter fat, the other group was getting corn oil, and the other group was getting peanut oil. Sadly, at the end of the year, they sacrificed the animals. But when they looked at the arteries, far and away, the most progressive cardiovascular disease was seen in those who were having the peanut oil. Pretty amazing how that how it works. You also had mentioned mouthwash, and I know a lot of people hear that sometimes, they don't understand, but what does the fluoride in the mouthwash actually do? Uh, does it eliminate the nitric oxide from being produced in, in your mouth? I learned this, and you'll have to check with him, but uh, Dr. Nathan Bryan out of the University of Texas, who was the pioneer in uh, really this uh, alternate method of producing nitric oxide. And uh, he is, apparently has found that fluoride, whether it's in public drinking water or whether it's uh, in toothpaste, can inhibit this process of restoring more nitric oxide. Interesting. Um, no, no, Azastin, um, once you have heart disease and you follow your method like rigidly, um, after 10 or 15 years, is there anything else where you could do like test or, or is there anything which you can do to verify the situation? Oh, to see whether it's you've, you've progressed. Yeah, well, there's yeah. a number of ways you can do this. You can start out. This is, a, uh, I, would, uh, I would really discourage a patients from getting an angiogram. That okay. is a formal angiogram, either through the wrist or through the groin, where they introduce a catheter up into your heart and introduce the catheter into the heart arteries and they inject eye. And uh, there is risk to that. Not much, but after all, you're getting uh, radiation. You're getting a contrast, which can probably injure your kidney somewhat. You can get a heart attack. You can get a stroke. So simply as a follow-up for somebody who's curious about whether they're doing well or not, uh, I think an, an angiogram is more than I would like. I would prefer, you can do an angiogram which does not have a catheter invade into the heart, which is a CT angiogram, simply introducing contrast to a vein in the arm and then timing it so that when you get the CT of the chest, that's when the contrast is going through the arteries to the heart. And that will show you whether the blockages that you had at the baseline when you started this compared to when you're having this maybe a year later, less. But even if you don't wanna have the, there's a, the, any of that dye introduced into you, you can do a stress test, a stress echo stress test. There's no radiation and there's no dye. And a stress echo test test can be compared maybe in 11 or 12 months to what it was at baseline. And we usually find that there is either marked improvement or the disease has reversed. We have a question that came in uh, regarding, you talked about eating greens and they wanted to know about vinegars. Are vinegars good to eat, balsamic vinegar? Is that a good thing to include on the greens? Well, I, I, I said, I think I made it clear it was uh, to, uh, moisten the, the greens with a uh, with a few drops. A, a matter of fact, the word I used was anoint. <laughs> anoint the greens with several drops. Uh, well, in other words, I don't want you to drench it with vinegar. But the uh, but there is a there is a mechanism there. Like the balsamic vinegar actually does something. Absolutely, yes. The vinegar is important. Yeah, that's mm. right. That's great. So always with the greens, anoint it with a little vinegar. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. Question. The, uh, the, the vinegars, that, but this is a, a Japanese study, and they were able to show that when they had two groups of women, um, the healthiest women on the planet, a, a Okinawan woman between the age of 17 and 34, and in the, half of the group was the control group. The other group was having five additional green leafy uh, Okinawan vegetables daily. And they found that at the, uh, <clears throat> at the end of the study, when they measured the endothelial progenitor cell, remember those, they were strikingly higher in the women that were having the green leafy vegetable with the 
uh, either the balsamic or the rice vinegar. Glad I love balsamic vinegar. Ben, got a question? Yeah. Uh, additionally to diet dietary suggestions, are there any other lifestyle measures that can protect your heart? Uh, oh, yeah. I think you want to get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, be able to keep a nice circle of, of companions or friends. Uh, I think exercise is important. You don't want to smoke, but the most, uh, the most important of all is what you eat. Yeah. Be sure that you're not injuring the endothelial. Question from our audience has to do with carotid arteries and once they're blocked, can that be reversed? Oh yeah, we have, uh, <clears throat> we've had several delightful <clears throat> uh, reversals of carotid disease <clears throat> that was demonstrated. I'll, <clears throat> I think I can share with you uh, one patient from Canada who was uh, really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. At, uh, at age 45, he was having severe angina and he had a stroke. He had a blockage of his right carotid artery, but it was a mild stroke and he got over it, but he was having such severe angina. He ended up seeing a surgeon in Toronto. The surgeon in Toronto, thank you. Uh, even with the one major artery to the brain being occluded was able to go ahead and do the surgery and he got a wonderful result. So now he was 69 years of age and he was in trouble again. He had gained 40 pounds. He was diabetic. He had all that angina again. He had erectile dysfunction. And in his one remaining carotid artery was now 90% blocked. And of all things to happen at this time, his 37 year old daughter had a heart attack. And following her hospitalization, she found a book prevent prevent and reverse heart disease. And she said to her father, Pop, we really got to do this together. They did. I'd never had heard of them until a year later, I got a letter. And the letter said, Dr. Esselstyn, I wanted to thank you for your book uh, because I've lost 40 pounds. My diabetes has gone away. All my chest pain and angina has gone away. I no longer have erectile dysfunction. And my left carotid artery, which was 90% blocked, is now 67% blocked. So yes, yes, even the carotid arteries respond, the coronary arteries respond, and the arteries to the legs respond. And we've been able to demonstrate reversal in all those categories. A question from the public. How does caffeine affect our heart? How does... Uh, caffeine... Yeah, I, I, well, caffeine is a stimulant. And a matter of fact, for people who have atrial fibrillation, that's one of the things that you like to cut out is uh, alcohol and uh, caffeine because it may trigger a bout of atrial fibrillation. Uh, the rest of your question was what? About caffeine. I oh, the, uh, about yeah. Uh, no, I'm not really. If you uh, are not at risk for atrial fibrillation and you happen to want to eat green tea or black tea, which as caffeine. I don't object uh, to that. But there is a study, one Greek study and another uh, Italian study uh, that has pretty well convinced me about coffee with caffeine. And what they did is they took a group of healthy young volunteers, divided them in half. Half of the group was drinking coffee with caffeine. The other half was drinking a coffee that was decaf. And after they drank the coffee, they then did the brachial artery tourniquet test, which is a measurement uh, at the brachial artery at the elbow to see how responsive uh, whatever they're doing is to uh, make the artery dilate. And so after they did this first study, they switched groups so that the group previously that was having coffee with caffeine was now decaf. And guess what? It was always the group that was having coffee with caffeine that injured the endothelial cells and were unable to dilate the artery. Incredible. I think we have time for two more questions. And we've had a couple of questions come in about statins. And one of the questions is that if you eat 100% whole food, plant-based, no oil, and your LDL still doesn't go down, this particular person's is over 100, are mm -hmm. you okay or do you need to go on statins? A couple of things about uh, statins. When statins were invented in 1986, 
the leading killer of men and women was heart disease. Well, now what? 30 some, uh, 37 years later, guess what the number one killer still is? Heart disease. So they haven't really got to wipe that disease off the planet. And I've still run a monthly seminar uh, with patients throughout Canada, throughout the United States who come in virtually. And we have a five hour program where we discuss the causation of heart disease and how we can empower them as the locus of control to halt uh, and reverse their disease. Now, many patients who were, apply to come to our seminar have learned long before they ever heard of me that they could not take a statin. They had some severe muscle cramps, or it might have been injury to the liver, or it might have been the production of diabetes, or it might have been brain fog. So here's a group that simply couldn't take statins. And if they follow the program as, def as defined, they do just as well as the patients who are on statins. And uh, it's interesting that if you will go to my book and look in the picture section, there, uh, there are five different demonstrations of how you can re reverse disease. Uh, either through objectively through seeing it on, a, on an angiogram, reversing. You can see it reversing in what we call pulse volume. And you can also see it reversing in what we call a PET scan. So those are very, very powerful areas. Also, you see it reverse on a stress test. You'll see a reversal of the symptoms of angina, of uh, claudication. And uh, so it's really quite exciting when you can see how promptly these patients can reverse this uh, mm -hmm. disease. Now, it's, I have to be square with you and say that when you have somebody who is a patient who is young, by that I mean uh, under the age, let's say, of, of 40 or 8 or 50, often we find that those are the plaques that are made up of inflammation, fat, and cholesterol, that the body can really uh, do quite a job of reversing it. On the other hand, older plaques that have perhaps been there for maybe uh, decades or so uh, are made up of fibrosis, scar, and calcification. And the likelihood of those uh, completely melting away is less. But interestingly enough, what we have found is that even those patients seem to be able to get back to full activity of daily living without restriction. That's good. I had time and I had slides I could show you how that happens. You had one question about why it is that this country has not reversed this disease. Reversed and we've known about it for hundreds of decades. A couple of things. Uh, going back to our, the, our study of 2014, of those, 20, those 200 patients, uh, it's interesting that we were running about a 90% uh, compliance, which we're pretty proud of. And I, I really like to make the point tonight that one of the reasons that you, that physicians are reluctant to try to offer this to patients is it says that they, uh, patients won't follow it. But we, if you're going to see a patient for 10 or 15 minutes, all right, in the office, the likelihood of you're getting a lifestyle change is zero. Uh, the way we do it is our uh, our actual seminar is one single day, but it's for five hours. And my secretary will give me a list of those 18 or 20 patients who are going to be attending the seminar. And she'll give me that list two weeks before the seminar. That allows me time to call every one of those patients myself. I guess I'm a little old fashioned and I want to get my arms around their story. And at the same time, permit them an opportunity to ask questions of me so that coming to the seminar, we have a firm platform from which we can all move forward. So it, I guess that's not a very long, that's a long way of answering statins. But uh, for people who are willing to follow the program exactly, they will see, it's actually when you look at the picture section in the book, they'll see two or three of our most profound examples of disease reversal occurred in patients who could not or were unable uh, to take statins. And you'll get to ask yourself, how many statins are they taking in rural China, Okinawa, 
Central Africa, the Papua Highlands. Yeah. And you had answered actually two questions at once because somebody also had asked the question about how to get clinicians to get their patients to follow this program. You said you, know, you have to take the time and spend it with them, right? Well, I have to also be, have to be a little bit honest about this because right, <clears throat> right now it's a little bit awkward in cardiology because despite all their education in medical school and postgraduate in cardiology, they never get any training in nutrition. Uh, I was invited, uh, I guess about a decade ago to join, become a member of the American College of Cardiology, which I did. And they asked me to join their nutrition committee. And one of the jobs of the nutrition committee is to try to educate patients or actually educate doctors about the causation of disease that they are uh, treating. And I think that uh, it's very, uh, I've had so many examples of it and I, he I always hesitate to mention this, but I would be remiss if I didn't. What do you suppose the compensation is if you do bypass surgery compared to what if you do stents? compared to what if you just use drugs. In other words, what I'm here to tell you tonight is that there's absolutely nothing in the way of what present cardiology is working is going to treat the causation of the illness. Drugs, the drugs they use do not treat the causation of the illness. Stents are worthless as far as causation of the illness. Same thing is true of bypass surgery, but there's no question the compensation you get for bypass, stents, and maybe a lot of drugs uh, is quite <laughs> impressive compared to if you talk about Brussels sprouts and broccoli. <laughs> but what we do know, Dr. Esselstyn, is that what is of incredible value is all the work you and your family have done and keep doing. So we want to thank you so much for being on our show tonight. On behalf of Ben, Judy, who couldn't be here, and myself, you've made such an impact in the community and on a lot of lives. And for that, we so appreciate what you've done. So thank you so much for being here. Jim and Ben, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. All really right. good. <laughs> so we have actually the Esselstyn Foundation will be back with us. Dr. Esselstyn, Jane and Anne will be with us in the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan for a two-part series of daytime webinars game-changing nutrition for cardiovascular health. That is going to be in late February. Next month on the 23rd, we will have our next Heart to Health. Andrew Freeman will be with us 7 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday, the 23rd. And as always, if you want to watch any of our episodes again, you can always do so through our YouTube channel. They're always there. It's the Plan Powered Metro New York. And on behalf of Judith and Ben, I'm Jim Spellos wishing you good night healthy life, and hope to see you next week again on Heart to Healthy Heart. Thanks so much.